card games. What is the most important skill in trading card games? Reading your opponent? Bluffing? Strategy? Luck? It's money. But deck building is a close second. For most card games, deck building starts and ends with a Google search. Someone far smarter than you has already discovered the optimal deck list that you should be playing. And so you just play that. I know draft is a format in some card games, but the deck building is fast and clumsy and takes a backseat to both luck and play skill. But what if playing the deck was secondary to actually building it? Slay the Spire does just that. To understand how different Slay the Spire is to other card games, let's go ahead and compare it to some. In most card games, your opponent is just another schmuck with a deck, but in Slay the Spire you aren't just battling against another person with a deck of cards. You are climbing a procedurally generated spire, full of enemies to battle, shops to shop at, and events to event at. Your goal is to slay the spire, by climbing to the top and defeating everything along the way. That's a lot cooler than playing some cheating 12-year-old with the flu at your local game store. Another big factor in deck building is how many cards you can have in your deck. You see these rigid values, these barbaric games force you to follow? Not only is there no deck size requirement in Slay the Spire, but the number of cards in your deck is going to constantly change as you add stronger cards and remove weaker ones. Some strategies want lots of cards, some want very few. It all depends on the situation and the cards offered to you. So what's stopping you from taking every card and playing them all every turn? Energy. Energy is everything. It's how you play most cards. You start the game with three energy, and it refills every turn. Each card has a different energy cost, and some even give energy. Because of this, you need to choose your cards very carefully, and each one needs to do enough to make spending energy on them worth it. For example, here are three cards of different energy costs that all deal damage. The more energy the card costs, the more damage the card does, but not always. Pommel Strike deals less damage with the upside of drawing a card, all for one energy. However, you could instead play Hemokinesis, dealing more damage with the downside of losing two health. Both cards are different, but do similar things, dealing damage. Neither card is strictly better than the other, but they can all be strong in different decks. And that's the genius of Slay the Spire's deck building. You are constantly juggling which cards are best for your current unique deck, and this juggle never stops being fun, because you slowly get better at it. There are times when you are offered three great cards, and other times it's three terrible cards. But sometimes it's the card you never gave a chance, pulling the whole deck together. Let's talk about this. Who the hell is this? Or this? Or that? This is you. And I'm sure that throughout this video you've noticed all the different card colors. Well, each one is part of a different character's card pool. It ensures that your cards are more likely to combo together and helps create a different play experience from character to character. So here they are. The Ironclad is the most basic character. He does big damage by buffing strength within flame and demon form, or just playing bludgeon. He also blocks big hits with cards like Impervious or Rage, and combines well with Barricade for great value. You can even play more recklessly than other characters due to his ability to heal after each combat. The Silent is a step up in complexity. She loves to debuff her enemies and buff herself for compounding advantage. You can poison enemies with deadly poison and bouncing flask for huge damage or play millions of zero cost cards to machine gun down targets. To my her ability to draw more cards helps her play more zero cost cards and draw cards like footwork and after image early to buff herself sooner. 
the defect has balls or orbs sorry which do a large variety of things lightning and dark orbs deal damage frost orbs generate block and plasma orbs give free energy the defect has the greatest variety of decks to build so far you can focus on just one orb or all of them you can play with max amount of orbs using capacitor or destroy your orb slots with one of my favorite cards consume for additional value or you could just ignore the orbs entirely and focus on powers like creative AI and heat sinks, or use zero cost cards and then play them all again with an insane all for one. The Watcher is a bipolar monk that will take her time until unleashing a devastating combo and dealing 200 damage in a single turn. Her design is based around stances and each stance has a different effect. Her calm stance has no effect until she leaves it and gains two extra energy. Her wrath stance deals double damage while taking double damage herself. So, the goal is to enter calm with cards like Vigilance and Fear No Evil. Next, enter wrath using Crescendo and Simmering Fury. Then, deal double damage and end combat with cards like Ragnarok and Wheel Kick. But, there's a third more secret stance, the divinity stance. Upon entering it, you gain three energy and then deal triple damage, but it only lasts a single turn. Other than blasphemy and its huge downside of losing the game, the only way to enter divinity is by acquiring 10 mantra using bad cards like prey and worship. The watcher clearly has the highest skill ceiling and playing her makes my brain hurt. <laughs> Having four different characters with a huge menagerie of decks that they can each construct creates a lot of variety. To add to all of this variety and randomness are relics. These tiny icons at the top of the screen are relics, and they do things. Most have quite minor effects like buffing you or debuffing the enemy. Some others trigger after doing stuff. Every tenth attack deals double damage with pen nib. Every tenth card draws a card with ink bottle, and every time you shuffle your deck, gain six block with the abacus, and many, many more that do just such a wide variety of things. An important type of relic that can only be found after defeating a boss are all the energy relics. They all increase your energy max by one with a downside. Philosopher's Stone makes all enemies stronger, Busted Crown reduces your choices when adding cards, and Runic Dome stops you from seeing enemies in tents. Wait, what? Enemies actually tell you what they are going to do, the turn before they do it. Right here, above their heads, for example, this means they'll attack, this means they'll block, this means buff, and a few others. This helps you know when to play what. Is the enemy attacking? Play your block cards. Are they about to buff? Get in damage while they're distracted. It's the sole mechanic that makes every turn a puzzle and not a guessing game thus making the whole game less bullshit. That's about everything I wanted to cover. I'm skipping over a few things like potions, basically the whole shop and neutral cards, upgrading cards, curses, and the giant beating heart hidden away at the top of the spire. All in all, Slay the Spire is one of the most fun and creative games I've played, and I see myself playing it for a very long time to come especially with ascension levels making the game harder after every victory, and the daily climbs with their wacky twist on core game mechanics. But no matter what, it's a hell of a lot better than Solitaria. I really want to say thank you to everyone at Megacrit for making this game. I've really enjoyed it. And also a thank you to everyone who gave me feedback and helped to make this video possible.